live going live And here we are. Hey, we're, we're live. I can see that when the the delay is not as uh, prominent as it used to be, where you know you would go and say, "Okay, we're," I think we're live now, right? I mean, I mean, you would say that, but you know, and would there would be a lag? But now we're 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 live. So that that that's we're 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 live. Goodness sakes, get all my gizmos going. Hey, hi everyone. It, it's Emil Emil Guillermo. Emil Amuk to you, uh, Emil Guillermo Media on the Facebook page of the Filipino American National Historical Society Museum, the FONS, F-A-N-H-S, FONS Museum uh, Facebook page. We're, we're going out live just as a way to like open up the door. Oops, <laughs> gotta watch my, open, open the doors virtually of the museum today. It's, uh, we call it Sunday brunch because, okay, bring your own food. We'll call it whatever you want, but it's Sunday brunch. Welcome. You know, the museum's closed again because of COVID, you know, San Joaquin County was, you know, it was purple and we thought, oh, we'd open it. And we thought, no, no, let's wait. And then and then it went back up to, or we, we were red. We were down to red. Red is a good one. That San Francisco is red, but most of the state is purple. And then San Joaquin was 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 a uh, was a uh, red, and now it's begun back up to purple. So now we're closed, and it's a good thing. You know, I was. Uh, you don't know if you're going to get a cold or the flu or both on top of COVID. It's a uh, it's scary because the 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 weather's changing. It's getting colder, and. I, I you know every now and then I, I think it's it's related to sleep. Look, if you're not getting enough sleep go to sleep, get some sleep. That's the best antidote. Um, Arascaldo, hot soup, something. Um, you, you know, it's uh, everyone has their own little thing that that does it. But bottom line, rest and sleep. And um, I, I was feeling something the, the other day or, you know, just yesterday. And I thought, oh, it's because I'm not sleeping. Um, I, I slept a little more. I feel a little better. Take care of yourselves. This is this is the reason why you just can't um, you can't just say, "Hey, bahala na." I'm just going to go go for it. I'm going to be with my my friends, my family. You just don't know who's asymptomatic. You just don't know who's showing signs. We know that a quarter from the from the surveys, we know that about a quarter of the people are asymptomatic. So everything seems fine. And some people would say, hey, look, I'll get the virus. It'll be okay. I'll, I'll withstand it. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. I mean, there, there, are peop there are people who get the virus and they can come out of it. But there are people who have some underlying things that get exposed or if they know they have underlying things like diabetes or, or some kind of heart or lung issue it's just not a good time to risk it. So I hope you're staying put. I hope you don't have travel plans for Thanksgiving. And this is why in, uh, in a roundabout way, you know, why the, why the museum's closed. It's just not safe. Stay put, stay safe. You know, let's, we know where the spike is. Let's try to uh, maintain good public health so that we can all come back together and enjoy January, maybe February. I mean, because you know what happens if we have this super spreader uh, on Thanksgiving, a national super spreader, and from the looks of it, it looks like people are are jamming up the uh, the airports and people are, are are traveling despite the fact what the CDC says. But if we have a super spreader event 14 days after Thanksgiving, wow, that puts us right there with uh, a not so merry Christmas. So I. I hope that we show we all show some prudence and we prepare for a Filipino Thanksgiving like we've never seen before. You know, where we're, you know, looking at each other's 
turkey plates on Zoom or we're lifting up a toast. That's the kind of Thanksgiving I think we should have this year. And I hope you're planning a, a safe one as well. Anyway, so we're closed at the museum. We're opening up the doors this way virtually. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, you know, I had some things. I said I was going to talk about Vincent Rodriguez III because, you know, that's a big deal. When Crazy Ex-Girlfriend on the CW went with a Thanksgiving Filipino show on network television on November 15th, 2015, that was uh, television history. It was television pop culture history with a Filipino American lead, Vincent Rodriguez III, a, Fi a Philippine uh, Filipino American uh, theme and Filipino American actors. In fact, I, in the chat box, I put down who remembers the crazy ex girlfriend episode? And the last name was Paras. And I'm sure that it was a family member of one of the actors who was in that crazy ex girlfriend episode. So I'm going to talk about Vincent Rodriguez III. Uh, we'll also talk about a little about Celine because November 19th, if you recall, was the day that Celine Navarro was kidnapped in 1932 or the day that she disappeared. And that's where she's taken by uh, the folks at Dumas Longhouse and stuff happens to her. She's found buried alive. And uh, I'll point to the webinar we did that you can access and, and find out more about the story of Celine Navarro. And then I wanted to thank some people for being such good, faithful donors to our, our fundraiser. And we'll do that all, uh, all in our short little time together here, the Sunday brunch of uh, the Museum Virtual Pop-Up for today, November 22nd, 2020. Because I, I looked at the calendar, I said, November 22nd. We know the importance of that date all Americans of a certain age, not just Filipino Americans, but all Americans of a certain age. will remember November 22nd, 1963. You know who, who you are, uh, are the people who are our mo most loyal patrons at the museum are of that certain age. And you remember what happened, the assassination of uh, JFK, the John, Fitzgerald Kennedy, President of the United States in Dallas. It's been an, a, a national obsession, really, ever since then. And I know for a moment, do, do you recall, do you remember um, where you were when, I mean, this is sort of the typical question, where you were when you first heard about this, uh, this occurrence? And let me, let me share a screen. So I can show you my, uh, let's see here. I, I, I wanna share this with you because, only because it is, it shows a, a Filipino living room. This is my Filipino living room. There's my dad holding up a cup. I'm sure it's not filled with soda. Um, here, here's a, okay, here's, Oh boy. Here, here I was on Fulton Street in San Francisco, the Western edition growing up. But you notice, I mean, I'm incidental in the picture. I'm, I'm really the coincidence. The main part of this picture that you must pay attention to is right here, the television set. The television set was the anchor and continues to be somewhat, right? The anchor of the Filipino American living room, right? And so here we were, my father's a cook, my mother's a, a housewife. I'm thinking of my father's a union cook. Boy, we're, we're, we're middle class in America. I'm all of like seven or eight here. And, and, you know, we're living in the Fillmore in San Francisco. And this here really is the center of, Filipino American life. You notice it, it's got the TV set, right? I think it was a, an RCA, had to be an RCA. 
And then you have the catamaran, the Filipino catamaran, and we had the, these things. Remember, we had no cable. We had rabbit ears, rabbit ears. And, and then the Filipino, the floral Filipino palm or fronds on the, on the floor. Uh, so look, I'm sure you recognize this sort of living room setup. Just, just forget about the, the boy there. <laughs> this, I'm showing you this because this is where life came out of. Life came out of the box. This is, and so when we talk about Kennedy, the images in, the, my, in my mind about Kennedy came from the box, came from the TV. Remember that? Uh, you know, we would see them driving down Dealey Plaza in Dallas, and then we'd see the, the, the limousines, and then we'd see the, the shots happen, and then, you know, you know the, the, in the motorcade, and that that really was the the Zapruder film, right? I mean, everyone around that Dealey Plaza area, were you know they were taking their little film, had their film cameras out. Zapruder was just one of them, but you know the TV sh TV stations certainly were showing clips of the president's motorcade, all of that out of the TV, and then the. The rush, the ambulances, uh, the ambulance rush to Parkland Hospital. The the wait, the wait for the announcement. You know the uh, the disposition, of the health of the president, and then the days that come after the 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 word at Parkland Hospital. Uh, the arrest of Lee Harvey Oswald in downtown Dallas, the shot of Jack Ruby, the nightclub owner with his gun reaching out in the, the, the parking garage, reaching out to shoot Lee Harvey Oswald. And then, of course, the subsequent days after that, the funeral and seeing John John with his short pants and Caroline with their mom. Those are all the, I mean, you ask about the historical event and how many of you, it has to be almost all of us, right? We, unless you were there in Dallas. The, the flashes of history that you recall have to have come out of this box or a box similar to this. Hopefully you had your rabbit ears on and you had a clear reception because it was all black and white. It was the black and white world. And that's, that was our history. So take a second, think of your living room. Think of where you were in 1963 and think of the box. I mean, this is the box where I saw things like um, Emil Griffith, the uh, welterweight champion fight where I saw in San Francisco, they showed uh, roller derby. My father was a big roller derby fan. I know that there was roller derby in the Stockton Auditorium. They kept talking about Stockton Auditorium. I was in San Francisco, and they kept, kept talking about the roller derby in, at the Cow Palace. I remember the roller derby. I remember wrestling. And the big star was of the day was a guy named Pepper Gomez. Pepper, oh, Pepper Gomez, when he'd go on top of the ropes and he'd jump on Ray Stevens, the blonde guy, the blonde villain. Those were good wrestling days. I haven't been much of a wrestling fan since then. But everything came, came out of that box, including all those images that I just talked about. JFK, November 22nd, 1963. You know, the odd thing is, is that when I was a reporter uh, in television, one of my first jobs was in Dallas, and I worked at a station, KXAS, which actually was in Fort Worth, the main signal, but they had a bureau in Dallas right outside Dealey Plaza. So I just remember I was all of you know, 20, 23, I think, in Dallas working uh, as a television reporter and just when I took a little break, I'd sit outside and I'd just look at Dealey Plaza from 
the parking lot of where the bureau was, which was right on the edge of Union Station there in downtown Dallas. And I could see the book depository building. I could see the, the grassy knoll. I could see where the limousines went. And then, of course, you know, during my time there, I was in Dallas two years, you just do the tour, right? You meet the guy who has his Zapruder film. You meet, uh, you go to the uh, the building where the, uh, the, the, the police department and where the garage is, where they got, where Jack Ruby got Lee Harvey Oswald. And you just think about how you were, or where you were back when it all happened. And for me, it was this little television set, just being glued to it, being too young to really understand what was going on. But then to be uh, an adult, say 14, 15 years later, to see the actual places, it was, it's the effect of history, right? The effect of, oh, it makes you stop, pause, think about the things that are happening, the things that have happened. And to put things into context, it's the effect of history. And uh, it's partly why we do what we do at the Filipino American National Historical Society Museum to think about those moments, to reflect and to put them in a perspective. You know, JFK meant something to the Filipino Americans. Let's put that in perspective. And it wasn't clear what would happen afterwards, right? JFK was the hope. I remember sitting in front of that television set with my mom and dad watching the variety shows. This is before the assassination. JFK was the popular president. He was um, a personality and he had that line, right? Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, right? And it was like, there was something about him that gave people of color, that gave Filipino Americans such great hope in the 60s. Remember, 1963, we hadn't even gotten civil rights the Civil Rights Act. We hadn't gotten to the Voting Rights Act. Uh, the anti-intermarriage laws were not off the books yet. In California, yeah, but the, it, the Loving decision that wiped them all off the books didn't come until the late 60s or the middle 60s. And then this was even, you know, before Vietnam, before Great Society, before everything. It's like, and yet here I was, a, a little kid thinking, oh, we had it made, we have our TV set. Our Filipino living room is complete. But it's, you see, when you look back and you say, wow, this was at least a year before the Civil Rights Act, which some people saw only in terms of black and white. And where did they put the Filipinos? Well, we just trusted that Filipinos were part of that too. That Filipino Americans would be a part of that. But it was primarily just like our television set and just like this picture, black and white. We kept our fingers crossed, of course. Then 65, the Voting Rights Act came. These are thoughts that come when you just mention November 22nd, 1963, the death of President John F. Kennedy the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Just remembering it today and uh, a reminder that sometimes the big important events affect us Filipino Americans more than you think. You're not gonna see it talked about or you won't see it written about anywhere necessarily except in Filipino publications, except in places like the museum, we'll talk about it because we were affected. 
we were affected. And it's good just to take a moment, like I said, to think about it all these years after. And, you know, and there was a, there was an apex where, you know, the conspiracy theories and, and, you know, the Zapruder film and investigations and the pop culture come, you know, movies come out, Oliver Stone. And, and then it sort of settled down a little bit, I would think, because right now in our history, we have our own little sense of turmoil in our democracy about making sure we have a smooth transition of power and that making sure we can certify an election and that there is a president elect. And I, I know we're building toward a kind of hope, but we have our own unique turmoil in 2020 post election or in the midst of an election month. It used to be just an election day, but now we have an election month and of course, on top of all that, the coronavirus. It's funny with, with some perspective, how interesting it is to, to look back at November 22nd, 1963 and say, wow, how simple things were back then. How relatively easy things may have seemed until that one event on November 22nd in Dallas rocked our world. So I, I just wanted to share that with you. Bring it up uh, in your real live lunch and see what kind of conversation you get. I mean, I'm... I mean, it, it opened up the way for, for Johnson to come in, right? The, the vice president and vice, uh, vice president Johnson did some great things. He had to na navigate some, you know, some things in the South to bring, to bring the country together. And then of course we had the war. So whatever may have seemed idyllic, Camelot, right? The Kennedys, uh, things are going to change as things often seem to do. So uh, I wanted to talk about, you know, the November 15th, 2015 or November 15th. Yeah. 2015. It was the anniversary of crazy ex-girlfriends Filipino Thanksgiving show. Now, I, I, I talked about it yesterday. I talked about Rachel Bloom. I said, hey, if you want to rent it, you can, I think you can buy it. You don't just rent it. You can buy the 45-minute show and see how this young Jewish girl who's hot for this Filipino guy learns to cook dinugan and brings it to Thanksgiving. And I thought, well, you know, what was the last time I saw, you know, I'm vegan, so I, I don't, I can't remember the last time I had dinugan. But I don't think if, if you had, if I were not vegan and I had a plate of dinuguan, which is pork blood stew, and I had a plate of turkey and all the trimmings, I don't know. Would I still want to taste the dinuguan? Maybe if someone had some sealy or something like that, maybe, but I don't know. I think the, I think the turkey might have won out over the dinner but of course filipino thanksgiving you have it all you have no no portion of the table is left you know uncovered by something a plate of something so dinner guan of course we'd have dinner guan right and why not and where's the pinak bet did you not bring the pinak bet for the vegans for the vegans are you did not make vegan pinak bet Oh, and uh, what about the curry curry? Oh, oh no, no, not, not just just a little bit. We don't have to overdo it. Yeah, no. Oh, yeah. Filipino Thanksgiving, right? So anyway, Rachel Bloom, um, crazy ex-girlfriend. Uh, you know, the, 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 
she made the the love interest um she made the love interest vincent rodriguez the third and i had the good fortune let's see let me share this again i had the good fortune of uh talking to vincent let's see let me get let me get to my my page here uh i had the good fortune of talking to vincent when the show happened and, and you know here's the thing about it may seem like a trifle to have filipino thanksgiving a show on a network tv but it's it's not it's it never was it never happened before this is an historical marker and it's worth talking about now as we come as we come up to one of the I would say this is a consequential Thanksgiving. We've never had a Thanksgiving like this. And let's hope that we play it safe and everyone's healthy on the way out and it doesn't become a problem. But I wanted to bring this up because this is a point of Filipino history. Vincent Rodriguez III as the love object of Rachel Bloom, CW's Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is my kind of show. So, like I said, I've talked. The, the key question is the lack of diversity in movies and TV. You know, I always talk about it in my writing. And if you ask Filipinos and Asian Americans about one of the issues that is important to them, you know, they might mention healthcare, they might mention education. But darn it, if they don't mention, we don't see ourselves in the media. We don't see ourselves in television shows. We don't see ourselves in the movies. I mean, that really has come up with some, I think the National Asian American Voter Survey brought that out, that these are real concerns of Asian Americans. We're pop culture consumers. We wanna see ourselves. And if we don't see ourselves, we are invisible. And that's no way to be. So I write about Vincent Rodriguez III as the Filipino American diversity trailblazer, I call him. Let me read from my piece here. I said, a generation ago, I shunned an acting career in favor of TV journalism because of a lack of roles. I, I couldn't play the lead in a TV series, but on the local news, I could be the lead simply by standing in a raging flood water and getting all wet. Or from standing next to a five alarm fire and risking smoke inhalation. Rodriguez, on the other hand, is part of a new day and a new headline, and now he gets the girl. I mean, when was the last time you saw a Filipino American male love interest on TV? I wrote this in 2015, mind you. And, and who was that SAG after member named Never? Yeah, that's the guy. That's the Filipino guy. His name is Never. If the recent comic wave Rush off the boat, Dr. Ken and Master of None has established that Asian Americans are back on Hollywood, Hollywood's TV radar. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend has gone one step further for a broadcast network show. In a TV universe when Filipinos are hardly visible, the show has lifted Rodriguez to a new level. Rom-com hunk. Look at him. He's a rom-com rom -com hunk. Not the driver, the cook. Or, dis, or indiscriminate minority guy number three, right? There's always indiscriminate minority guy number three somewhere on a script. Or he's the driver. Does anyone out there remember the show Burke's Law? Filipino driver. Or the cook, remember? Rodriguez gets the girl, rejects the girl, gets an even hotter girl, then is pursued by somewhat less hot girl, a crazy ex-girlfriend. That girl would be Rebecca Bunch, played by Rachel Bloom, the star writer and co-executive producer of the show, along with Aileen Brosh McKenna. Considering Bloom's recent victories at the Golden Globes and Critics' Choice Awards for Best Actress in a Comedy, she's far from crazy. Especially as to diversity and having Rodriguez's Josh Chan, that's right, they use Chan as a, as a surname, as her Filipino object of desire. You will notice. Filipino object of desire spells out F O O D. Food. In 
SMH, shaking my head parlance, that would acronyme, oh, I already said the joke, Ac acronymize into food. And wouldn't you know, that's what got me hooked on the show. Filipino Thanksgiving is not much different from any other Thanksgiving, though if the turkey doesn't have a roast pig as a companion, there is likely to be the entree of Dinuguan. So you look, they got the turkey. Look at all, look at all that food. Does that look like your table? Does, does it, they say Stockton twice in this episode, in case you're counting. At least twice. Do you know what? It's a pork butt stew that's cooked until the blood is thick and grainy, drenching little bits of pork butt, pork belly, and maybe sliced pig ears for crunch. They ate it on the show. Another American Filipino first on network TV. And I have monitored these things ever since I watched JFK's funeral on the family black and white TV. Isn't it ironic how TV is central to all our things, all these main events in our lives. Filipinos believe Dinaguan, a vegan's high cholesterol nightmare, a punchline on a network show. And in language, not sanitized by referring to it as chocolate meat. They don't say chocolate meat once. I've said it once here already. They don't say it once. They call it Dinaguan. Rodriguez said Dinaguan wasn't just a prop. This is a quote. He told, he told this to me. Her plate legit had dinaguan on it, and each take the food would disappear, Rodriguez said. See, he's like dishing on his co-star saying she was eating it. She told the prop guy to keep filling her plate. She said, I'm going to eat it. It's there. I'm hungry. I love Filipino food. I'm eating it. I love Rachel Blum. But that, now this is why you know why Rachel Bloom looks like Rachel Bloom. She's eating dinaguan. Rodriguez explained that Rachel grew up in Southern California around Asians and Filipinos. Our show is normalizing Filipinos, but we were always here. We've just never had this kind of exposure, Rodriguez said. Rodriguez grew up in the San Francisco Filipino enclave of Daly City, the Northern California version of the show's West Covina. See, he's a Daily City boy. He said he got hooked on musicals watching Newsies. And as a martial artist, he saw Gene Kelly and realized that dancing was a more nonviolent martial art. Now 33, add four, because that's four years ago is when I wrote this. A fact that he somewhat regret being public, although I referred him as a Filipino, he will look 33 for the next 50 years, which is practically a scientific fact. Rodriguez is on a show that has heat and is getting noticed. He's auditioning for roles in movies and TV that would normally be cast with a white actor. In fact, it was an issue he brought up with his bosses, Bloom and McKenna, at his audition. I asked them this question at my final callback, he said. I said, why is it Josh Chan and not Josh Smith or Josh Leibowitz. You could have easily gone with some other white heartthrob. I was flattered to be there. And I also thought, why am I here right now? Why did you guys make it this way? Because Aileen and Rachel are head writers on the show. They're both executive producers and they both made this choice. And Aileen was saying that she and Rachel both grew up in Southern California. And of all of the hot surfer bro types, they were definitely Asians among them just as hot as the white guys. So they said they wanted Josh to depict that because it was something they had never seen on television. And then after getting the job, Rachel admitted when she was younger, she had some huge crushes on some Asian guys. She would go out of her way to go to the place where this guy worked on the chance of seeing him. Sounds like the show. It's all based on truth and their upbringing and background and where they grew up. And after hearing that, I said, I grew up in my own West Covina, up in North, up North in Daly City. And I went to school with Josh Chan. I feel like I know who this person is. I actually feel like him. It feels like me. Feels like you. Rodriguez would seem to be a perfect match for Rachel slash Rebecca. There they are. But the show is not called Crazy Ex-Boyfriend. Something 
tells me a twist is coming. Or as they say in the proverbial writer's room, things will be revealed. In the meantime, there's no guarantee for a new season. So for the next few weeks are a test of sorts. Frankly, I'm rooting for Rodriguez's character, Josh, and for the show. In an odd way, I see myself as a flip side to the Rebecca character. I went from the West Coast to the East Coast to attend Harvard and date Jewish girls. That didn't quite work out either. I've often said that when we all have a love interest in each other, diversity will simply happen and through our hearts work its way into our lives. Ultimately, it did for me. But I can't help but think of my dad when I saw the show. For Filipinos who are called lusty rabbits and face discrimination for interracial love when they first arrived in the 20s and 30s, it's been a long time getting to crazy ex-girlfriend. Rodriguez told me they weren't really aware of it when they were shooting the show. But the image of a Filipino family through Rodriguez's Josh on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is much more groundbreaking than anyone can imagine. Good thing he had the courage not to give up. A family member two years ago, when I was borrowing money, said I should consider another line of work in case acting doesn't pan out. Because if I needed help, I couldn't run to them anymore. Rodriguez told me it was a very powerful member of my family and that really shook me and made me very afraid to pursue what I wanted, knowing that it was going to be a dice roll. But he'd been in New York for more than a decade at that point, doing every odd job imaginable. Listen to this. I've scrubbed the dirtiest toilets. I painted bathrooms, bars. I did what it took to survive in the city to do what I love, Rodriguez said to pay for the dance class, the acting class, the seminar. My agent said, I have a lot of perseverance and that whatever I have, they should bottle up. I just had this feeling inside. It's not just about me anymore. I am Filipino, but I also love what I do. I'm very passionate about it. And that's what made me stand out in not always good ways, but I'm living my life happily and doing what I love. And not everyone gets to say that. Having this job is its own ultimate reward, but also rewarding is knowing that me being here means so much more to other people and gives other people hope for our culture and for where the entertainment industry is going. That's Vincent Rodriguez III speaking, and he remains hopeful. But even star and executive producer Bloom knows how hard it is to get a project uh, produced in her Golden Globes acceptance speech, she talked of almost not having a TV show. We made a pilot for another network and they rejected it, she said. And we sent the pilot to every other network and we got six rejections in one day. And we felt like crap, but we knew it was good. Time for Hollywood to learn the lesson. If it wants to tell the new stories that reflect the modern audience, it will need to pay more attention or it'll need to pay more than lip service to, ver to diversity. The boardroom folks with the purse strings should take a tip from improv. Say yes. And so you see Crazy Ex-Girlfriend's Thanksgiving show really ties in to Filipino American invisibility, which is a theme in history, which is a theme in media, and which November 15th, 2015, really shows the significance of a Filipino Thanksgiving as the anchor of a network comedy in prime time on the CW, Crazy Ass Girlfriend. Uh, that was my interview with Vincent Rodriguez III. There he is with uh, Rachel Bloom. And, you know, as is the case, it's, I don't know what he's been doing since Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend did extend a couple of seasons. And, um, and now you can, uh, you get typecast. And if, if I, I hope, Vincent is getting more and more roles, but if he's not, he made a breakthrough with Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, an historic breakthrough. And here it is five years later, we're talking about it. 
So uh, my suggestion to you all is as you, let's see, let's stop share. My, my suggestion to you all is to, when you have your Zoom, small, ah, a rent or you, you can purchase Crazy Ex-Girlfriend that, that dinner or that show, watch it. There's some explicit parts, so make sure you get the right X uh, G rated ones. But uh, you can also go to YouTube, but it's just my suggestion for having a Filipino Thanksgiving 2020. All right, now uh, I wanted to mention also this week in Filipino history, you know, we did that Celine Navarro webinar and I, I hope that you know where to go in our Facebook, the Fonz uh, Museum or Facebook at Fonz, F-A-N-H-S Museum and go to that Celine webinar, go to Fonz Museum slash live and you see all the videos there. The webinar of Celine Navarro's based on the documentary that's out, Celine Navarro, of course, the woman who in 1932 was kidnapped and then found buried alive. And that story, that story you can, you can catch in our, our webinar, but the significance of November 19th, that was the day she was kidnapped. You know, she was staying in a boarding house uh, around the Lathrop area, um, which is south of Stockton. And she witnessed something right? She witnessed members of the uh, Caballeros de Masalang do something about, uh, you know, being in some altercation. She testified against those de Masalang members. And they were, they were, they were, uh, they were convicted, sent to San Quentin. The revenge against Celine Navarro seems to have taken place after all that testimony, November 19th, she is fearful that she's being followed and she disappears and she's not found again until she's found buried alive. We talked about it here. If you're curious about the story, this would be a nice time to revisit that. Check it out on our webinar on the Celine archives, the documentary on Celine Navarro. Okay, um, one more thing before we uh, depart for the day. And I want to, let's see, what am I, where am I going here? I'm sharing, <laughs> you know, I don't share that many screens. Oh, well, this is, uh, this is the, uh, Okay, I have to go here. Let's go here to Facebook. Okay, I want to thank people for contributing to the museum. You know, it, it, it has not been easy, um, the, the COVID period. I, I became the museum director in February, March, COVID. We've been shut down. Our rent is due and it's just been really, uh, it's been difficult. And if it weren't for things like our Facebook donations, um, we'd be more in trouble than we are. I mean, we have a base. We have a, a floating base of, uh, of funds that we've raised over the years, over the last 10 years, just, just to make us stable. But as a microorganization, we still have a budget of around you know, 30,000 a year that is taken from donations from people who come in free and then and make donations to uh, the museum. But we've been shut down and people haven't been able to do that. So we've turned to Facebook, Facebook, uh, the Facebook donation uh, idea as a way to raise money. Uh, October was not just Filipino American History Month. It was also my birthday uh, month. And so everyone on the board takes a shot at asking their friends and family to help support the museum. 
I've done it a number of times already. Uh, we, we just fell short of our fundraiser, but I, I did say that for people who uh, contributed, I would thank them. So I want to people, I want to thank, of course, my wife, uh, uh, you know, she, she gets thanked a lot, but I want to thank people in particular, like my, my college, not college, high school, high school friend and junior high school friend, Brian McFadden, Brian donated, um, uh, his, his amount and said he would match. And he did. People answered the call, matching funds, great thing. Brian McFadden, he lives in Texas now, and we vowed that we'd get together again once this COVID thing has, uh, yeah, gave him a little heart. Uh, Joan Benjamin Brown, a woman I hadn't seen since, I saw her one high school reunion, but you know we went to Lowell High School together. Thank you, Joan. I wanna thank uh, Zari Denegri, an old family friend, $25. You know, it doesn't take a lot. If it, a little bit from a lot of people, uh, you can be like Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. It, it just adds up. You don't have to bust the bank and give me a lot of money or get, it doesn't go to me. This goes to Facebook. Facebook doesn't get any money and the money goes to the museum. So thank you, Debbie Lowe, friend of Barbara G. Thank you to, uh, I just want to, this is like, sort of like an honor roll here. Uh, Terry Keating, thank you very much. Jaime Gaega, thank you very much. Magira and Masa Salonian, thank you very much. Carlton Sorrell, thank you very much. Pam Bulahan, thank you very much. Julia Maya, thank you very much. Nancy Oda, thank you very much. Uh, repeat offenders, Joyce Sarkeesian. Joyce is from Indonesia. And we met in third grade, no, second grade at Edison Elementary in San Francisco. And I was the Asian Filipino boy and she was the Indonesian Asian girl or yeah, Indonesian Asian girl. And we've, we've been friends ever since second grade. Thank you, Joyce. Repeat offender, 25. Thank you very much, Joyce. Barbara G, we, um, we held a, a, the group Cold Blood in San Francisco, did benefit concerts. We did a benefit concert at Lowell High School. We had Cold Blood as the, as the big star, as the big draw. We got some money. Barbara was, uh, was part of the trio. They put it together along with uh, John Crittenden. And, you know, once you do something like raise money, you're like bonded. <clears throat> what are we raising money for next? Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Uh, Terry Escada, thank you. Escada, thank you very much. Uh, Helen Workman, an old friend from junior high, uh, the sister of a, a, a really good friend of mine. And she's become a good friend just because she's interested in all these Asian American things. She's half uh, a Japanese American and and has a has a real solid heart. Thank you, Helen. Sky Valentine, um, another woman who discovered us here on these pop ups. Thank you, Sky. Uh, Alicia Art Arambulo Silva. Thank you, Art. Uh, Ginny Mabalit Bartolome. Thank you. Yeah, it doesn't take much. We. You know, throw in five dollars into that. John Crittenden, uh, my high school buddy, a repeat offender again. Thank you, John. Brian, a repeat offender, had the match. Thank you, Brian, for stepping up and helping the museum. Gregory Salas, seventy-five. Gregory Salas, from the legendary South of Market, the Canon, one of the Canon Kip boys. I'll never forget because you know they're like. You know, they, they, they walked funny in gym class. Not funny, but they were styling all the time. And Gregory was, uh, he, he never forgets. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you. Paulette Baker. My father was a cook. Her father was a cook. Her mother made the best blueberry pie. I never had blueberry pie before. It was always like some kind of frozen apple pie. But her mom was a baker. And Paulette was like my 
my little sister. Paulette, thank you. Thank you very much. Ellie Faith, Ellie, thank you very much. H Julian, Julian. Jul I call him Julian. We call him, I, actually, I call him Jin because, you know, who had, who had time to say all those syllables? But Julian is uh, like a brother to me and a repeat offender. And he gave on the birthday, on the birthday. Julian, thank you. Really, um, a great artist, a great friend, a great uh, big brother. Irene Moy, another great repeat offender, friend of the museum. Thank you. Marissa, Marissa Guillermo, uh, the wife of, of my late cousin. Thank you very much, Marissa. Uh, Tessie Francisco. Thank you, Tessie, and one of my oldest relatives. You see, it, it, takes a, it takes a village, right, to donate to the museum. And you can donate to the museum, not, not necessarily to my fundraiser, but on the museum page. Chris Castro, another great stalwart member of the museum team. He's got the, the fundraiser for November. Click on, on his on his uh, donation page. It all comes and helps the museum. Nolan Hale, a buddy of mine. We, uh, we did stand-up comedy together. Nolan, a funny guy, a truly funny guy. Thank you, Nolan. Uh, L. Cruz, thank you, L. All these October, oh, Magira and Masa Salonian. Thank you, Magira. Joey Tobacco, oh my God. New York money in the house. Joey. Joey's a good guy. If you don't, one of the, one of the, the videos to see again is the Joey Tobacco video on our Facebook live page. He talks about New York. He talks about the UN. He talks about Queens. Good guy. Joey Tobacco. Thank you, Joey, for contributing. Uh, Troy Espera, ABS CBN guy. Good buddy. Thank you. Joyce Sar Sarkis again. All my, you know, these friends, repeat offenders. Anyway, that was an October fundraiser that stretched out all the way to uh, to now. And I, I just, um, I just want to thank all of the don donors. I said I'd do something special, a shout out. You know, we can't shout out enough um, because, as I said, every month we're still in the museum business and we have to figure out a way to, to tell the Filipino American story. This is a way that we can do it easily enough to a good many of you right here on this, this vehicle, Facebook live. And then it's recorded, but it's, it's live. We're live. We're, we're, you know, you're seeing us in the flesh. We're not, you know, there's uh, no artifice here. And um, and so when you respond, we appreciate that. Uh, there are other ways to contribute. Um, if you see a story or a post on the Fonz Museum page that has a button, just go ahead and click on the button. Uh, go on the Fonz uh, Museum uh, Facebook page. You'll see other ways. You can buy stuff through Amazon. You can Amazon Smile. Uh, other ways to contribute. Like I said, we are... I'm grateful for your support and grateful for your for your suggestions as to where we should go with the museum. So any messages to me, send me an email, Emil Amok, E M I L A M O K at uh, gmail.com, E M I L A M O K at gmail.com. And um, I guess that's it. That's it for our, our brunch. Uh, so I hope you learned something today about. Filipino Americans and entertainment. Um, Vincent Rodriguez III from Daly City, who uh, was the heartthrobbing crazy ex girlfriend. Um, hope, hopefully, maybe we'll talk again before Thanksgiving. I just hope that you're not traveling. I hope you're playing it safe. Um, this virus is for real. It's not a hoax. I know a lot of people think it's a hoax, but and a lot of people have that Bahalana attitude, but. Don't, this is not the time for Bahalana. This is the time for let's let's be prudent. Let's stay home. Let's be safe. 
so that we can spend more time with our loved ones. So that's it. Uh, I told you how to contact us. Check us out. I may pop up live. You can email me with your suggestions about other things coming up if you want to talk about other things uh, in the future. Thanksgiving, we got Black Friday, we got oh, all sorts of things. And, and then we're in the Christmas season. So uh, have yourselves a great Sunday. My name is Emil, Emil Guglielmo, uh, speaking to you from um, my, my, my gong closet. Thank you. Have yourselves a great, uh, a great Sunday. And as uh, my dear late lamented friend, uh, Professor Don Mabalon is wont to say, Mahals and Salamats.